guess I'm the moderator. Good morning. Uh, my name's Eric Anderson. I'm a fourth year medical student. And I worked with Dr. Moshefar um, for the first uh, two weeks. So I want to talk about um, what we worked on, and that's the regression of conductive keratoplasty in patients uh, with, or with or without refractive surgery. Oops. Uh, just a brief overview. Conductive keratoplasty, or CK, uh, delivers radio frequency energy applied intrastromally to the periphery of the cornea. Uh, this causes shrinkage of the collagen and then steepening of the central cornea. Uh, full circle of CK spots is applied, and it's a number of CK spots and the optical zone uh, that it's delivered to that determines the degree of myopic shift. Um, so for example, this is a treatment pattern for a single surgeon, um, and it shows that do eight spots, eight millimeters, you get about uh, one diopter uh, myopic shift. If you do eight spots, seven millimeters, you get 1.75 diopters of shift. Uh, just a quick timeline of conductive keratoplasty. It shows that uh, numerous methods have been used uh, to sh change the shape of the cornea uh, using thermal techniques. Uh, started with a medical student um, in 1898, a Dutch medical student. He cauterized um, rabbit corneas, and he was able to induce uh, one to three diopters of astigmatism. Um, it was followed by collagen, uh, corneal collagen research that showed that collagen uh, shrank at 55 uh, to 58 degrees Celsius. Uh, it was followed by Coffin that used a heat metal probe in 1975, and then uh, Fedorov, a Russian uh, physician, use hot needle keratoplasty or hot needle in the eye. Um, and according to the research I found, uh, the temperatures were up to 600 degrees Celsius, uh, so well above um, what was needed. And then uh, laser thermal keratoplasty um, in the 90s. Um, this led to um, an uneven treatment effect. And then CK FDA approval um, in 2002. And the idea that CK uses um, inherent electrical conductivity of the cornea, and uh, this pr produces a more um, uh, stable effect. Um, HNK, or hot needle keratoplasty, was performed in the U.S. in 1988. I did find a newspaper clipping I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, this is from 1988 um, in New Hampshire. Um, and the Russian government said they're going to invest about $2.6 billion um, into 13 centers um, if patients were on a circular conveyor um, they do hot needle keratoplasty. I don't think it ever came to fruition, but it was interesting. Uh, so FDA approved indications, um, low to moderate um, hyperopes, uh, 0.75 to 3.25 diopters of hyperopia, and then you need uh, 0.75 diopters less for refractive astigmatism. This was the initial approval, and then in, um, it, it gained supplemental approval for presbyopia um, to induce monovision correction, usually about 1.5 diopters of near vision. Um, but it came apparent after approval that there was a regression effect. Um, but there's only been a few studies of patients um, that had LASIK or PRK and then went on to CK. So we wanted to show that um, in those patients, uh, the treatment effect of CK was more stable. Uh, so we picked out um, the mean uh, refracted uh, spherical equivalent. Um, this was a standardized way uh, to evaluate the regression um, in the few studies that I found and then the best corrected visual acuity uh, to measure the outcomes. Uh, patients and methods, a retrospective chart review of 52 patients, um, 18 had sufficient follow-up, uh, six patients or seven eyes um, had CK after LASIK or PRK. Only one of those patients had PRK. And then 12 patients, 50 un under eye, fi 12 patients, 15 eyes uh, were the controls. Uh, patient demographics, average age was about 55. Uh, Follow-up time, there's a, a big range. Uh, controls were uh, 17 months, um, and the CK after LASIK was 24 months. There was no significant difference between the baseline of the two groups. Uh, the preoperative refraction, just looking at the spherical equivalent, uh, was about 0.8 in the controls and 0.27 um, in the CK after LASIK or PRK. Uh, the CK spots were also less in the LASIK patients, around 9.6. Um, this was shown that the LASIK patients had a greater uh, myopic shift um, 
the initial studies like 2003, sometimes the my myopic shift was exaggerated by like three or four diopters, but eventually uh, with more experience it became less, usually around uh, 0.5 diopters. Uh, this is the post-operative refraction. If you look at uh, the change from pre to post as spherical equivalent, it looks like uh, the control patients had a greater effect of 1.73 diopters compared to 1.4. So about a 0.3 diopter uh, difference. Um, however, when you control for the different treatment spots, um, and then we use a mixed effect uh, linear regression, it shows that the LASIK patients actually had a greater response to treatment. Um, and minus means a greater response. So they had a greater response across the board in sphere cylinder and refractive uh, equivalent. Um, and it's not well studied, but we we're thinking that uh, the flap effects um, induce a decreased corneal elasticity, and this creates a, a greater uh, steepening effect. So some, some changes in the posterior, interior, and lower. Uh, we also looked at safety, uh, defined as a loss of two or more lines. Um, at six months, no patient had um, a loss of two or more lines, and they all had greater acuity of 20-25 and usually no loss of lines. Uh, so I start looking at the regression, we did a bunch of profile graphs, um, and it shows on average, uh, there is a trend um, after about six months uh, that you regress to the preoperative uh, spherical equivalent. And these were the, each line is a profile of the patient um, at 20 months. Uh, these are LASIK, pa LASIK patients at 30 months. Uh, it shows a similar regression to preoperative values. I uh, did a profile graph of both of the groups together and it shows um, that no group uh, lies above or below um, each other. So it doesn't look like from this graph that there's a difference between the groups. Uh, this is 50 months and then 30 months. And then once I went through all the data, I just quickly put it onto a box chart and did a quick linear regression and got pretty excited with the result. It showed that there was a difference um, of the LASIK patients, uh, these are about 0 0.02 diopters compared to 0.36 in the controls. Uh, it was significant at 0 0.038 uh, p-value. Um, however, on second look at the data, we realized that um, because the visits, the follow-up visits per patient are independent, uh, you can't do linear regression. Uh, so we had to take it a step farther. Then we did multi-level regression analysis um, and this showed that time sensor surgery is highly significant, um, but there wasn't a difference between the two groups. Um, so both of the groups had a regression of spherical equivalent of 0 0.03 diopters. And on average, at any given month, uh, the LASIK patients um, had a spherical equivalent of 0.38 diopters lower, um, but this wasn't significant. Um, and we thought that this was just a difference in the baseline of the spherical equivalent of like 0.5 diopters. Uh, so this shows us a graph of the regression analysis um, using the equation below. Uh, usually crosses the x-intercept at 25 months in the control patients and 34 months um, in the LASIK patients. That just gives you an idea how it regresses over time from six to 30 months. So in conclusion, we found that the CK was uh, safe and effective. Uh, no patient lost two or more lines of visual acuity. Um, they all had 20, 25 or greater. Uh, the rate of regression was similar uh, with 0 0.03 diopters, uh, spherical equivalent per month. Um, the LASIK patients did have a lower, on average, spherical equivalent per month, but wasn't significant. Um, but we did show that after controlling for the number of spots, the LASIK patients did have a greater response of uh, 0.42 diopters as spherical equivalent. Uh, conclusion continued. Um, because of the safety profile, CK does remain an appealing option for certain pa patient populations. Um, as more patients um, seek uh, refractive correction after LASIK, and if they have a, a thin lap or dry eyes or a flat cornea, um, CK uh, will fit them well. Uh, may, it may also be a reasonable bridge for low hyperopes uh, with early cataracts, it may be too um, early for a clear lens extraction. 
and also remains a viable option for presbyopes um, who are tired of reading their glasses. And I think that was that. Any questions? I know that was fast. Go ahead, Dr. Olson.
we try to increase the power just by including everybody that we had outside of Steve Morris. But, you know, still <coughs> you guys know that you have a lot of things. I mean, that's the problem with a lot of areas that we say we have to make up. Is we say, unless we can get a group of people to get some money, we can leave that whole problem of what's expected to study as though it's a fiction. And so you can sit for years just looking at a particular road just to figure out how, how it works out. Thank you. We'll move on.